In this lecture, I'm planning to make some remarks about Anna Karenina, the second of Tolstoy's great novels, written something like 10 to 15 years after he wrote War and Peace. Both these novels are enormous pieces of work. War and Peace was more than a thousand pages, and Anna Karenina was close to a thousand pages. When people looked at them, they were virtually overwhelmed <laughs> simply by their size, not to mention by the power of the novels themselves. In Western eyes in particular, at least in those days, it seems strange that a novel would be so immense and so enormous. You may have heard the phrase, the loose and baggy monster. The American-born writer, Henry James, who wrote mostly in England, made a remark that became famous when he compared a novel by Tolstoy to a monster harnessed to his great subject, human life, as an elephant might be harnessed for purposes of traction, not to a carriage, but to a coach house. His own case is prodigious, but his example for others dire. Disciples not elephantine, he can only mislead and betray. <laughs> Those are the words of Henry James. To James, it seemed incongruous in to have the form of the novel previously so carefully circumscribed, and you know this particularly if you read some novels by Henry James, dealt with in such length and power by a man like Tolstoy, whose force and talent James compares to the traction power of an elephant, hitched to a coach house, no less. Naturally, a writer with the fine and delicate precision of Henry James sees a dangerous precedent in the broad and sweeping genius of the elephant-like Tolstoy. James' remark has set off the imaginations of many critics when they think about the work of the great Russian novelist. In any case, I'm sure that everybody knows uh, Anna Karenina is a novel that has to do with adultery. As a matter of fact, one might almost call this a tragedy of adultery, and that leads to a certain problem in literature. The traditional dealing with the idea of adultery had been almost entirely uh, comic in the form of a French bedroom farce. It was quite conventional in those days, as a matter of fact in these days, to talk about a, a bedroom farce. But to talk about a tragedy of the bedroom, tragedy and bedroom somehow didn't seem to go together. The bedroom somehow isn't the place for tragedy, it seems. It was the skill of Tolstoy that turned this into a possibility, a possibility, of course, that made a very, very different form of literature. In Tolstoy's own life, he had once been called by the police to be a witness to the corpse of a woman who had committed suicide, who had thrown herself under a train. The woman had been the lover and mistress of one of Tolstoy's neighbors, and the police needed a witness for the inquest that came afterwards. It seems to have been this incident that jolted his imagination toward the idea of treating the whole matter of adultery. You can get some of that horrible reaction in seeing a corpse. In the epigraph of the novel, which is very heavy in Russian, as a matter of fact, it's not even Russian, it's old church Slavonic, Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord, and I will requite. That was taken from the epistle to the Romans, uh, chapter 12, verse 9. Clearly, uh, Tolstoy is making some kind of judgment here about the terrible action Anna took and what sort of a person she turned into that she would receive vengeance from the Lord God himself. As a matter of fact, when Tolstoy started writing the novel, he had gone through six or seven drafts, as most of his works did. The female character, uh, actually under a different name, Tatiana, was pictured in a way that would be difficult to have any kind of sympathy with her, whereas her husband, Alexei Karenian, was treated as a very noble and fine gentleman. But once the author did this, and obviously this showed something of Tolstoy's attitude toward the event that came from his imagination, he soon realized that the novel simply wouldn't make sense that way, it wouldn't have any balance. Uh, you, you couldn't write a novel like this and make it seem realistic if you portrayed the woman so badly and the man so well. So, step by step, the character of the woman whose name turned into Anna went higher and higher in a moral sense, and the character of her husband went lower and lower. So in the actual novel, Anna is somebody I think virtually every reader engages a tremendous amount of sympathy for, at least partly from Tolstoy himself, whereas her husband turns into a bureaucratic, empty, unfeeling, short-sighted kind of person that you really wouldn't want to have much to do with. I would call him a windbag, but perhaps it's a bit strong. The novel begins, oddly enough, with a satire on the tragedy that's going to take place. The beginning sentence of this novel is probably the most famous beginning sentence in all of literature. 
Все счастливые семьи похожи друг на друга, каждая несчастливая семья несчастлива по-своему. All happy families resemble one another. Each unhappy family is unhappy in its own particular way. This is the beginning of the novel. It's followed by everything being in confusion in the Oblonsky household because it turned out that the master had been in sexual relations with a woman who was acting as a caretaker for one of the children. The wife, whose Russian name is Daria, but everyone calls her Dolly. Notice that here, uh, English names, it's, it's the style to turn Russian names into English, unlike what we saw before in an earlier time when they turned them into French. Dolly is terribly upset. She wants nothing more to do with her husband. She wants to completely reject him. How could he possibly do this? Here she had worked very hard and raised a large family of children, and here he was off having what he considered to be happy relations with a governess of the children, for God's sake. In the opening part of the novel, we see Stepan Ablonsky, but they call him Steve, or in Russian, Steva, who's sleeping on the couch rather than in bed because his wife has tossed him out of the bedroom. The novel opens, that is, that scene, opens with one of his dreams. Again, we see the position of dreams in Russian literature. He's terribly upset and doesn't know what to do. He realizes he's done something terribly wrong, and yet, somehow, he can't quite bring himself to condemn his own act. It seemed to be so natural. He's the man who likes to take pleasure where pleasure can be grabbed. What's the matter with that? Of course, it's easy enough for him to say it, to imagine what it looks like to the wife. What we have here is another variant on the character we saw in War and Peace. That character was the old Count Rostov, who always did everything wrong, and yet, somehow, you ended up loving him, not knowing exactly why, but there's something attractive about it. Oblonsky is exactly the same kind of character. Of course, the actions are not quite the same. But everything that Oblonsky does is wrong and brings judgment from his fellow characters, and most especially from the character named Devian. This major character in the novel is a deeply thinking and feeling person whose behavior will form a strong contrast to that of Oblonsky. As I said, like with Count Rostov, everything Oblonsky does is morally wrong, and we know it, even he knows it, but somehow you can't help liking the guy. There's something tremendously attractive about him. And again, it's Tolstoy's commentary about that old notion of comme il faut, the idea of conventional morality, of doing everything the way society decides it should be done. Well, the title character, Anna Karenina, is actually the married sister of Steva Oblonsky. Of course, her maiden name was Oblonskaya. She gets the news of Steva's affair, and she decides she'll come back and try to set things straight for their family. Obviously, it's rather ironic that Anna, of all people, should solve the problems of adultery, which is going to produce a terrible tragedy later in her life. In this part of the novel, the adultery is really taken from the point of view of the author rather lightly. Although it wasn't taken lightly by Dolly, who's a member of the Shcherbatsky family, by any other of the women in the story, and Tolstoy also understands that. Anna comes, and she tries very hard to somehow reconcile Dolly with her husband, Oblonsky, who is, of course, Anna's brother. She manages to talk to Dolly in a way that Dolly understands. Well, then, after all, there has to be a kind of forgiveness. A family is at stake. A life is at stake. Steva isn't really as bad as she thought he was in the shock of the realization of the adultery. I, now, I wouldn't want you to think that I take the adultery lightly. I certainly don't. But somehow, Tolstoy makes this come across in a somewhat comic fashion, that very same adultery which is going to be tragic later in the novel. Now, there's a young woman in the novel, uh, Kitty Sherbatskaya, who is quite entranced by Anna. She, she's, uh, Kitty is much younger, of course, than Anna is. She sees in Anna a very beautiful, attractive, stylish woman who in, whom in many ways she, Kitty, would like to emulate. Now, Kitty is being wooed by a man named Count Alexei Vronsky. Vronsky is supposed to take her to a ball, and she's very much looking forward to the ball, to which Anna, as a visitor, is also invited. To Kitty's horror... When Vronsky sees Anna, he has eyes for nobody but Anna, and he simply ignores Kitty. In short, Kitty is jilted by the very man she was counting on to get a proposal from and become his wife. As you might imagine, this is terribly uh, upsetting to be jilted by Vronsky, who makes it even worse by entering into an affair with Anna. Kitty goes into almost a kind of mourning. 
She's Dolly's sister, so Dolly comes in to console Kitty, who's fallen into a deep depression I, I talked about before. Kitty realizes that her sister has come to offer her consolation, and wouldn't you think that she might be pleased by this, that her sister cares about her, but instead, her reaction is one of them being infuriated because she thinks that Dolly's looking down on her and making fun of her. This is only an excuse to come in and show how superior she, Dolly, was to her sister Kitty. Kitty tells her that she would never come back to a man who betrayed her. Dolly might, but she, kids, Kitty couldn't. And for a moment, both sisters realize the strength of the insult and the cruelty, a terrible thing to say to your sister. A terrible mutual feeling breaks out between them. There's no quite fight quite so bitter and quite so hot as a family quarrel. As the two sisters are there, ready to tear each other apart, suddenly they both break into tears as if this were the necessary lubricant without which the machine of mutual communication between the sisters could not work. It seems to me, now mind, mind you, you could argue about this, I'm sure, but it seems to me that Tolstoy does something very unusual, perhaps even unique, for a male writer. He manages to see the world through feminine eyes. It's as if he gets himself into the head of a woman and sees the world the way a woman would see it, rather than through the eyes of a male uh, observing women from the outside. Even Dostoevsky, with all of his colossal psychological insight, observes his woman through male eyes, which after all is perfectly natural. He is after all a man. How Tolstoy pulls this off, I don't quite know, but he manages to do it. Now I have to add here that this could produce very well produce a certain amount of argument among women. I once tried to argue this in a class of mine at Northwestern University, and one of my very bright and articulate female students said to me, with an emotional effect I will never forget, Professor Weil, what do you know about women? Well, I had to admit the obvious fact that I am not a woman, that's for sure. But I said, look, after all, I have a mother, I have a wife, I have a daughter. These days, at least, I have a granddaughter. I know something about women. She said, nah, you know nothing at all. So I'm not sure I could convince someone like that of my argument, but I still remain convinced that Tolstoy did have this uncanny knack of getting inside others in spite of the fact that they were very, very far from his own experience. He did this to the extent that he could actually even get inside the head of a woman. And I must say, I don't know of any other male writer, at least that I've encountered, who was able to do this. Now, the affair between Vronsky and Anna, which started after they met again, after they met again at the ball, could lead to some very serious problems. The Karenian family was, after all, a very highly placed family in Petersburg, the capital in those days. Karenian was a highly placed bureaucrat, and this was something he was not about to take lightly. Although, one thing we also have to understand is that Karenian seems to have a very cold and repulsive kind of character in many parts of the novel. Yet, in spite of all that coldness, one thing is unmistakable, and we see the original portrait that Tolstoy had in mind of Karenian. He deeply loved Anna. He feels deeply hurt by the fact that Anna has betrayed him. He's hurt that Anna has turned her affections toward another man in spite of the fact that she did this obviously in part because of the characteristics in her husband she couldn't stand. He cracked his fingers. He had long ears, that kind of thing. As a matter of fact, one might go so far as to say that Alexei Karenin couldn't live in a normal fashion without Anna. So the beginning of the realization from Alexei Karenin that Anna really is going away from him is a very painful thing for him to take, and of course, in turn, for society to take. This is represented by Tolstoy in a rather unusual way in this novel. As a matter of fact, uh, Nabokov, the famous critic and writer, has gone so far as to call Anna Karenina a novel about a horse race. Vronsky, who of course is going to be the lover of Anna, had a very fine horse that he loved by the name of Fou Fou, a French name he gave to the horse. He was going to ride this horse in a steeplechase race. The horse was obviously very sensitive, very high strung, and had to be handled with a very light hand, because even if you made the slightest wrong move, you could ruin the horse in yourself. Clearly, a certain analogy is being drawn between the relationships between Vronsky and the horse and Vronsky and Anna. So the race takes place, and Anna and her husband are in the aristocratic crowd watching the steeplechase. And somehow, Vronsky manages to get Fru-Fru over the first hurdle. Tolstoy describes the race in considerable detail. Then he manages to, then he, that is to say, Vronsky, manages to get Fru-Fru over the second hurdle, then the third and the fourth. These things are very difficult to manage. 